And we are live. Welcome to the Art of Collecting. My name is Carolina Kaufman. I'm with the Pentecrest Museums. And this program is brought to you both by our museums and the University of Iowa Libraries. I would like to introduce our host today. You've already met me. We also want to introduce Elizabeth Reardon. Elizabeth, if you could introduce yourself. Certainly. My name is Elizabeth Reardon. I'm the Outreach and Engagement Librarian for University of Iowa Library Special Collection and Archives. Thank you, Elizabeth. Happy to be here today. It's really great to do this with Elizabeth because she is actually one of our collectors featured <laughs> in our My Collections uh, exhibition program that we have here at the university. Along with uh, that, we are also um, co-hosting this program for the CARES grant, um, a Connected for Life series for senior living communities that we're hosting this program. So if you're coming from a senior living community, we will have this as well. And let's begin. Great, so I wanna start by um, thinking about what actually is a collection. So we wanna help define that a little bit. A collection is a group of objects or materials that have been gathered or grouped to be seen or studied and kept together. A collection is determined and curated by the person who own or is in care of them. Typically a minimum of three related objects are considered a collection. So that's how we're defining them currently, but what is it about a collection and why do we collect? But before we think about that question, I want to ask the audience if they'd like to share in the chat. If you know or you have collected anything, please share what you've collected. We'd love to know where you're coming from. I know we have collectors in the audience, so feel <laughs> free to share in the chat what you collect. Pencils. Pencils. Thank all right. you, Aaron. Okay. Wow. Now a bunch. <laughs> Stones. <Land>. Stamp. <laughs> Awesome, candy bars, African violets, wow. Necklaces, Fossils. yeah. Fossils, oh, I love all of this. Someone said buttons, they're after my own heart. <laughs> candy bar wrappers, well, what happened to the candy, I wonder? That's mm -hmm. great. <laughs> oh, chickens, <laughs> this is fantastic. Small stained glass pieces and flowers to press, or dry press, that's awesome. <laughs> so please keep on sharing this, this is wonderful. Um, obviously, we have a a fascinating community with us today. Yes. Interested in collecting. Now, I also want to then think about, um, based on what we're hearing today and your own, own perspective, why do you think people collect? Can, can people in the audience give reasons why somebody might want to collect something? What would be a reason somebody would want to collect? Thrill of the hunt. Mm -hmm. Great. Oh, they love the thing. Okay. What else do we have? Preserve memory, love the mm. objects. Something my grandmother collected. That's very sweet. Nostalgia. Nostalgia. Wow. I'm hearing a lot about a memory and I'm hearing a lot of things that um, are, are um, that drive interest, obviously, um, that are passionate about it. This is great. Well, this is, these are all really good reasons. Um, we're gonna show a slide that shows all the many, many reasons, including the ones you've mentioned about the reasons why we collect. Um, and collecting has somewhat changed over the years, but one of the things that we wanna think about too is, you know, as a species, we're actually really wired to collect. Um, people may or may not realize that, but, we, but it, it comes down to brain science, which is really interesting. Early humans um, as hunter-gatherers needed to collect things in order to survive. It was really, really important. And um, this area of the brain, which is called the frontal cortex lobes, it was responsible for a variety of, of things that we, we do, um, such as memory, people talked about memory, emotions, judgment, planning and organizing, being creative, and problem solving. Now, if you think about those skills, you can translate that back into collecting. We are natural collectors. And in fact, we can think of collecting as a way of survival because our species have survived from collecting, if you think about it. But we've also been unique in that we know how to represent our lives. Um, if we look at cave paintings, for example, from um, our ancestors, um, they, are, they are recording events, they are recording memories. Um, some, and as art developed over time, 
a um, lot of emotion was put into that, something memorable. Um, and then it's also thinking about how uh, a human might plan for their future a little bit. So collecting is inherent to our nature. Um, I will say that we're not the only ones. Uh, there are several species out there that actually collect in the natural world. And one of them I really want to highlight, I'm very excited about highlighting, is called the Australian satin bowerbird. Now this particular type of bird is fascinating because they collect things, but they collect very specific objects in preparation for mating and to attract the female. Um, the bird in the middle that you see is the male bowerbird, and as you can tell, they're holding a piece of blue, a, an item that's blue. Well, they know that females are very, very attracted with the, blue, the color blue. And if you look to the right, you'll see the nest that this bird has decorated and curated, if you will, like a collector would, but really curated for the purpose of survival and for the purpose of, of mating. Um, we actually have a real bowerbird in our collection. I have them right here. <laughs> and how fascinating that we have this. Um, it's called satin bowerbird for a reason because they're really, really soft. But the collecting and, that, and the, uh, the ability that this bowerbird has is actually unique because um, it's the, the frontal lobe that I talked about, the frontal cortex lobe, it's actually 80% bigger than most birds. And with this particular species, 10% larger than other bowerbirds. So Inherently, collecting is also um, in their nature as much as it is in ours. But let's examine um, a little bit more about the origins of, of collecting, and um, Elizabeth is going to help us with that. Definitely. So when looking at the origins of the hobby of collecting, collecting is definitely not a new phenomenon. Um, in her research, history professor Allison Carmel Thompson shows how collecting practices can actually be traced clear back to ancient Mesopotamia in the 3rd century BCE. As a note, though, only royalty and elites were really collecting for pleasure at that time, and only royalty and elites would really practice collecting as a hobby for centuries to follow. By the 16th and 17th centuries, we begin to see the popularity of something called cabinets of curiosities, which many of you may have heard of already, um, and we begin to see these appear. And cabinets of curiosities typically displayed exotic and strange items from the natural world, and in some cases, fictitious items from the natural world, like a unicorn horn or a mermaid tail. Uh, these could be a modest cabinet, like a real cabinet used for scientific purposes, or it could be an entire room, like the one you see pictured here from the 1599 book Del Historia Natural, where the rich displayed all they had acquired from far off journeys or bought for lavish amounts of money. And cabinets of curiosities really became this, quickly became this way to show the socioeconomic status for its curator. Uh, bigger the cabinet, the wealthier the collector. I mean, if you can afford a whole alligator for your ceiling, I think you're doing all right. Um, it shouldn't be lost on anyone that cabinets of curiosities hit their stride along the timeline of European expansion and colonialism. Rooms were filled with objects from far off places exploited by Europeans. And we see this issue, um, we see these issues created by these practices into the 21st century. These cabinets of curiosity were the precursor for museums and many of the most well-known collections became parts of the modern museums we see today. So, that's why you read a lot about repatriation today because institutions are struggling with the history of how their objects got to be in their collection. And we'll talk more about that in just a little second. Um, because then the final shift we see in the Western world anyway is the 19th century and the age of industrialization. And more people started making money, giving them the opportunity to start spending that money on things like collecting. The Victorian age we recognize as excessive in a lot of fronts, and though there was poverty, that was still a huge problem. I mean, a lot of us have read or watched Dickens films. Um, there is a rise in a middle class that had disposable income and was allowed, that allowed them to take part in collecting as a hobby. So Carolina, I'm gonna let you talk about this slide a little bit. Yeah. So um, with these changes, especially in, in the last, um, I would say, 40 years, um, museums are faced with reckoning in terms of how they are representing and providing a narrative or, if you will, authority of knowledge about their collections and about their exhibits. 
This is changing for a variety of reasons. Obviously, we have um, a, a more worldview of things. And um, in addition to that, with um, new, new countries being developed out of colonial countries, they are asking for a lot of these objects back. And, um, and the pandemic, in addition to um, social justice issues that we've had this past year, has exacerbated this and actually brought to attention in a much more forceful way about how museums need to address how they represent their collections, especially when it comes to ethnographic culture, uh, ethnogra ethnographic um, items, artifacts, and cultures in general. Some of the ways that museums are trying to respond to this is through repatriation, which is returning the objects to their origins. Um, this is an example here where um, we have a funerary object being prepared to be returned back um, here in the Midwest. Um, and um, revisiting again that narrative of how do we tell our history and what, um, what other perspectives do we need to make sure to include um, part of that sort of decolonizing the museum, if you will, but also just revisiting um, what does it mean to talk about collections in, a, in an inclusive way. And we're going to talk a little bit more about how we're doing that here at the museums. So what does collecting look like today? Well, the internet has really changed collecting as, as many of you probably already assume. The hunt for that missing item in your collection is now at your fingertips with resources like eBay. And of course, someone mentioned this earlier in our chat, it's the thrill of the hunt that makes collecting fun though. So maybe the internet isn't always the greatest thing for collectors, but it has made it so you don't have to travel great distances to get things for your collection. But the internet has also created space for collectors to gather as well and create these communities. No matter what you collect, there's a good chance there is a group somewhere online who share your interests. There's collector clubs, collector forums, collector mailing lists. It's all online. Um, so there's a community waiting for you to share their knowledge about a plethora of topics. And collecting has also entered mainstream culture in a lot of ways these last 20, 30 years. Um, it's everywhere on TV. Pawn Stars and Antique Roadshow brought attention to how much money collections can bring, showing collections as an investment. Um, American Pickers, uh, which you see the picture on the top here, um, who are there from LeClaire, Iowa, uh, show how collecting is connected to memory and nostalgia for the past. And something that isn't new, but it's been very popular during the 20th and the now the 21st century is companies using collecting as an advertisement ploy. So a lot of this is geared towards children because children are natural collectors. I had like 50 collections when I was a kid, I feel like. Uh, that's a hyperbole, just a little bit. Um, but you know, cereal, like this Kellogg's ad you see here would say, you know, keep buying our boxes and you can collect all of these little pog things or fast food toys. I think the best example of this is the frenzy that was created around McDonald's Thai Beanie Babies, the mini Beanie Babies, um, that created a frenzy at McDonald's during the 90s. Um, and then, you know, there's this, this ploy to get a frenzy about, um, what kind of icons are really popular at the time and that we want to collect. So McDonald's was really smart to create these mini Beanie Babies because Beanie Babies at the time were so popular. And so they, they played off of pop culture and what was really popular, Star Trek during this time. So Kellogg's was playing off of that. Anything to get you to buy their product and collect all, all five pods, you know? That's right. And I should add that um, these things are changing over time as new sort of trends come into our popular culture. Uh, generations are discovering different ways that they want to sort of think about their own identity, their interests. Um, they're curating, obviously, with technology now and social media, we're curating our lives um, through Instagram. We are curating our interests in food um, with the recipes that we share. So, um, and we're collecting all of these things in memory. So we really aren't um, that far removed from some of our ancestors that really want to tie um, memory with emotion. And that's all thanks again to that, um, that frontal, the frontal lobes that we have. Um, that's very unique to our species. And it's very exciting to see where this could be going. Um, in thinking about it 100 years from now, or, or 200 or, or 10,000 years from now, what will people look back to um, as a species in terms of collecting? So thanks for sharing all that. We're going to mention a couple of really interesting collections I think you have. Yep, so I just have a few slides to show you some uh, record-breaking collections in our cl um, around the world. Uh, Guinness Book and other, other people who keep track of this, this is where I got this information. So in Slovakia, a woman has over 62,000 napkins in her collection. Um, 
in England, there's a woman who not only collects 2,000 gnomes, but she's created a whole gnome garden sanctuary uh, in England for them. Here in Georgia, USA, we have a woman who collects miniature chairs. She's holding, if you can't tell really well, um, a miniature chair in a bottle because that was created at one point. Um, but she has 3,000 of those, which I think is great. And then someone said they collected pencils. And I'm curious to know how many they have because uh, someone in India has close to 20,000 uh, pencils in their collection. <laughs> But what about collections here at UIowa and in our own community? What can you explore here on campus? So here in Special Collections and Archives, we're home to many, many different kinds of collections. Uh, we're located on the third floor of the main library and we're gonna be open for walk-in appointments starting July 1st. So if I mention something that you're interested in or you wanna come and check out some of our collections, feel free to walk in starting July 1st and ask, ask us and we're happy to show you what we have here. Um, but by far, probably one of our most popular collections that we have is the Charlotte Smith Miniature Book Collection. So the Charlotte Smith Miniature Book Collection was created by Charlotte Smith, obviously, who's pictured here in the middle. And the story goes that Charlotte Smith uh, and her husband did collect books, and then they ran out of room in their house. And the husband was like, okay, Charlotte, we need to, we need to hold off. She goes, what about miniature books those will fit anywhere uh, and so she started collecting these and she donated her collection I think in 1996 to us um, and there was a, a several thousand and there are a couple thousand in there um, and we continue to add to this collection so right now our collection sits at just over 4,000 miniature books and to be a miniature book you have to be three inches or less um, so here are some pictures of the collection and here are a couple more I do want to point out real quick that these little teeny tiny dots in front of the magnifying glass here on the picture on the left, those are actually the miniature books. They're about one mi millimeter each side. Um, and there is print in there and you can read it with a microscope. <laughs> so uh, this is one of our most popular collections and there's a good reason for it. It's a lot of fun. Well, that is so fascinating. I have seen the the books themselves, and I I just can't believe that print can get be that small. <laughs> um, so thank you for sharing that, Elizabeth. Um, at the Pentecost Museums, of course, um, we're located right at the heart of the University uh, of Iowa campus. Um, we encompass the old Capitol and the Museum of Natural History. Um, we're open to the public currently on Fridays and Saturdays, and of course, we have um, engagement online that you can uh, visit some of our exhibits. Um, virtually. Uh, so we will share all the links later on. Um, but our collections, while they are very traditional and some of them very, very old, um, we are also um, trying to think about how we might um, want to engage the public further as we redesign some of our gallery spaces, like our new Lions exhibit. And of course, we, have, we do have an old um, <laughs> cabinet of curiosity that's right opposite our newest, um, our newest initiative called My Collections. And My Collections is, is a response of a variety of reasons. Um, one, I mentioned earlier that we talked about museums as sort of authorities of knowledge, but that's no longer the case. Um, it's starting to change and, and for good reason. We want it to be much more participatory and allow the visitors to help create their narrative and their perspective about what it means to collect or collecting um, and that they have knowledge too. Um, in this case, the collectors that we've chosen um, are really passionate and ha have very interesting um, uh, uh, have very interesting collections and collection stories. Um, but it comes to this, again, way of, of, of museums thinking about different approaches to engage the public and include them, me, allow them to be part of the museum's narrative um, and for the for future um, when it comes to learning about our history. So I want to um, turn now and um, invite, we've invited uh, three collectors today to share in their collection story and we're going to have a Q&A um, followed, uh, we're, we're going to follow that with um, any questions that you have from the audience, but we'll start with a few. Um, first, I want to um, welcome uh, Brian Kendall. Um, he was selected for, for the Kendall family Pez collection that he has and um, I welcome him to turn his camera on and uh, and um, introduce himself and his collection. Thank you, Brian, for coming. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, so I'm 
Brian Kendall, uh, and I got my start collecting Pez uh, when I started dating my future wife uh, about 20 years ago. Uh, she was already an active Pez collector, and we've uh, both continued the collection um, uh, in the past over the past 20 years that we've been together. Um, and uh, we mostly have Pez from the last 40 years. Uh, we have an, I would estimate, over 2,000 of the individual Pez and just cabinets and shelves full of um, additional uh, Pez materials, including cars and um, posters and uh, artwork uh, and all sorts of different things. Um, and uh, uh, so for, for, the hot, for the collection that I brought, um, I thought it was interesting to showcase some of the variety of, of different sorts of Pez. I brought in a collection of presidential uh, uh, Pez, uh, and uh, just as an example of the interesting sort of collectible types of Pez that they have that people probably aren't, aren't familiar with. Um, in addition, I tried to bring in materials that uh, showed off how Pez have kind of changed through time. So Mickey Mouse and Santa Claus are two great examples of uh, uh, how the sort of manufacturing process has changed over time where the, the original ones are look a little crude um, and have to be sort of parted together with multiple pieces where now with modern manufacturing, they're much more detailed and, um, and, and with printing technology has really increased what they can do. So they look a lot more like the actual characters themselves. Um, another uh, sort of collection I tried to highlight was um, advertisements. So I had a whole shelf full of advertisements where you might see the Geico, Gecko, uh, Wahlburgers, or the Target Dog are, are a few of the examples um, of uh, collecting Pez that, that I tried to showcase in what we had in the museum. Uh, for us, Pez has just been um, uh, something, it was sort of a go-to uh, present I would get for my wife. Um, and so a lot of her birthdays or Christmas or something, uh, I would try and uh, purchase something for her uh, to add to the collection. Uh, eventually it did result in us having some Pez themes to our wedding. So we had uh, the Pez bride and groom as the topper on our wedding cake. Uh, we also had um, some of the decorations and uh, all the tables had Pez and Pez candy uh, as part of the decoration. Um, and we had a gigantic Pez dispenser was where you put your, if you <laughs> your card with an envelope, um, uh, you could put it in a gigantic Pez dispenser that we had built for the wedding. Thank you for that. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Oh, my sound is a little strange. I will let Elizabeth take over to introduce our next collector. Yeah, so right now we have uh, Laura, who is uh, with Elliot, her son. And Laura, do you want to introduce your collection and how long you've been collecting? Yeah, so that's a matter of uh, some debate how long I've been collecting. Um, I grew up uh, near Keokuk, Iowa. My grandparents had a restaurant there. and. Um, it's actually nestled in the river bluff where the geodes come from. So I used to find them as, ki as a kid, um, but that took a long uh, amount of time off um, while I uh, grew up and then I had kids of my own. So my six-year-old is joining us and he's gonna stop eating crackers. Uh, and uh, <laughs> we did a, a bit of a pandemic hobby, you know, I needed to be um, away from big crowds and uh, something to do with two little kids. I have a, a four-year-old as well, just turned four last week. So we spent the whole pandemic uh, out in the creeks, uh, social distancing and reviving this uh, geode collection. There they are, I love that picture. So those are, those are some that are actually at the museum right now, um, but they have found a lot. Uh, that's actually my favorite picture of them period uh, on top of that big pile of geodes. It just cracks me up like, that was a good day, we found a lot. That's Hamilton, Illinois, which is right across the river from Keokuk. Um, but it's a way to, to spend time together, but also learn some science. We do a lot of um, observation of the geodes. We weigh them to see how heavy they are and whether they'll be good um, crackers, whether they'll look good when they're cracked. 
we learn about the time that they come from. Hey, Elliot, how old are they? 340 million years old. Yep, so about 340 million years old. That would be within the Paleozo Paleozoic era in the Carboniferous period and the Mississippi Mississippian epoch. And we talk a lot about the fact that this 340 million years old is the Mississippian um, time period. So we find a lot of Mississippian fossils right alongside um, uh, what we uh, collect as far as geos go. Um, these are some good examples. The one on the left is at, from Adams County, Illinois. Um, the one on the top right, uh, which is a, a bivalve there, uh, is from Warsaw, um, which is just uh, on the Mississippi River. And then the ones below um, are from uh, the Iowa side. So they're, that's a good representation of some of the fossils that we find that coexist with all these great geos. Yeah. Thanks so much, Laura and Elliot. That's fantastic. Um, I'm very jealous of all the fossils you've been finding. I think they're beautiful. <laughs> Um, oh, that's an example. Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. Um, can we go live on our video side? Uh, in a little bit, because uh, oh, okay. when we stop sharing, yep. Got it. Um, but yeah, we find lots of great fossils, lots of great geos. Um, you know, it's a lot of fun. Elliot, why do you like collecting? Um, I like to see the inside, and I have one geo in my bedroom that I cracked, and it looks like chocolate inside, like chocolate little it's true it's a it's a pyrite and rust uh, formation inside of one of the geodes that he found and it's one of the most unique ones we've ever found and he calls it his chocolate geode <laughs> chocolate geode that should be an actual candy bar i would love that i feel like that works yeah so <laughs> lots of questions and lots of different um mineralizations in, in, inside of these and you know everyone is an adventure everyone is a surprise and um we uh we have a really good time hanging out as a Mom and kid, mom and her two boys, and and collecting. It's fantastic. Thank you, Laura, for sharing that. And I also really love Elliot. Your description of your geode is really, really great because something about it attracted you, and I liked how you associated it with chocolate. That's <laughs> great. I'm gonna remember that. Um, uh, Elliot also is going to help share with us um, after the presentation when I send my thank yous to everybody in the audience, how you can actually crack your own geodes. He has instructions, so I'm excited to share that. Thank you, Elliot. Uh, let's move on to Elizabeth Reardon here. I'm yeah. going to let you take it away. So uh, I have been collecting butter pats now since I was in sixth grade, so about 20 20 years, 22 years, um, a long time is basically what you need to know. Um, you can kind of see some of my collection in the case right here. I got started on this um, uh, because of a family friend who collected them and she gave me a couple of her duplicates. And I really, um, you know, I stopped collecting them for a little while and just had them in a box and then recently brought them out. And, and what I really love about this collection was when I started, it was cheap. Like each pat was like one to two dollars, and I could actually. And when I say I could afford that, it was my mom who was paying for them because I was in sixth grade. But like, you know, I and you could find them in a lot of places. Um, one of my favorite activities to do with my mom growing up was going to antique stores. Um, and as someone said, and it's the same for me. It's the thrill of the hunt, seeing what you can find. And so this was something that was always thrilling to see if I could find a butter pat. And butter pats, for those who don't know, I should have probably explained this. Um, they are little tiny dishes that are about like three, three uh, inches maybe. Um, and they are specifically used to serve butter. That is, their, that is their sole purpose, is to have a pat of butter on them, hence the name butter pats. Um, and they had their biggest heyday in the 1880s to 1920s, but they were continued to be made um, well into the 60s and 70s for railroad lines and things like that. Um, and so I do, my collection does contain some more fine china pieces uh, made from companies like uh, Nippon or um, Haviland and, and those kind of companies. And then I do have restaurant wear, which you see in the brown case as well. Um, and yeah, so when, when collecting, it just means a lot to me also because I come from a family of collectors and uh, my grandpa was a huge collector. He collected tools and I mean like 800 hammers alone. He had a lot of tools. And so he, he made the shelf for my butter pats. Um, and so, you know, I have the newspaper clipping now. I was interviewed when I was in seventh grade. Oh, I got to keep 
clicking through the pictures. Um, you can see me there <sighs> in my monkey shirt. I was in seventh grade. I didn't know better about being photographed for a newspaper. Um, and they ask the question, they go, if there's a giant fire, you know, which butter pat would you save? And, and I, I went, I don't know. I just take an armful. But, you know, putting together this exhibit has made me really think about my collection um, and which one is my favorite. And I think when it comes down to it, I wouldn't actually save a butter pat. I would save the shelves that were made for them because those came from family and friends who who understood my love of the collection. So this putting together this exhibit has made me really introspective about why I collect, what this collection has become to, you know, has meant to me. Um, and it it's definitely gotten, oh, so there's a lot of family and friends built into this collection as well, because it was also, I was given a lot of gifts and everything like that as well of people who was like, I don't know what else to get you. I'm going to get you a butter pat. And I'm like, I love it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. I, I really appreciate learning more about um, what's special about your collection and the fact that it's not just the items themselves, but um, the people that surrounded you building this collection and your your grandfather's influence. Um, uh, Brian mentioned that a little bit with um, with with his wife. Um, if I would like to now open it, we're going to sort of have a little bit of a chat, and then we're going to go into Q and A to allow the audience to ask any questions uh, to our collectors today. Um, I also should mention that uh, my collections is available. Um, uh, my collections is a, is is something that is ongoing. We um, invite people to apply to have their collection, their personal collections, displayed with us um, every semester. So every semester in the fall and the spring, um, and if we're able to fit in a summer session, we're we're featuring two collectors each time. So this is going to be ongoing. We definitely look forward to future um, future invites of other collectors to share their personal stories and collections. Um, so as a group, um, for anybody who'd like to kind of continue on from what Elizabeth talked about in terms of what about the collections are special to you, um, feel free to share any additional thoughts on that. Well, I, I, I mean, uh, yeah, I think the, um, it's a great way for your kind of relatives to try and get involved with you in some way. So, I mean, here, here's an example of a, a Pez with a, a pacifier on it when uh, my wife was pregnant with our daughter. Um, you know, it's just a, a gift that, the, that um, someone could give us that uh, shared in the collection a little bit, but, you know, um, also sh sort of shared in the moment. So, um, it is good for making those connections with other people, but it's not just about yourself. It's about you know, connecting with others as well. Yeah, we've had that opportunity. A little feedback there. We've had that opportunity too. We've taken some friends. Um, Elliot actually um, sent geodes all over the country during the pandemic. So connecting with other people is such a important, um, an important part of this. Elliot um, sent them to pen pals uh, all over the country and got things back from different places and got to share our geo collection. What did, what did you like about doing that? Did you like that? You want to talk about it? Where, why did we send them off? Because we want other people to know how good geos are and maybe they can find some too if they get master those directions so they don't need them. And we, yeah, we even um, gave them to the museum that are part of the, um, I, I think they're in the gift shop now um, that people can pick up and crack because we do have, I'm not kidding, uh, probably 400 pounds of them on my porch still. So my collection is just a piece of that. But you know, it's really uh, a thrill of finding a rock that looks like this and then opening it up and finding, you know, a little treasure. So, um, you know, that's been a part of the connection that we've had too. Thanks for sharing. That's fantastic. Um, so um, I guess this leads to another question. Um, are there, uh, you mentioned um, one, but I welcome anybody, as Brian uh, used an example of, of a particular piece in his collection, the pacifier. I had no idea they ever made that. So that's pretty interesting. Um, are there any pieces within your collection that are really, that have a really cool story or, you, or a story you want to share? Well, I couldn't, I couldn't 
bring it because it's in the case, but you can see the picture of the pet behind my head um, that's got the numbers on it. Um, that is actually a butter pet that was a salesman example. So he would go around to different restaurants and be like, here's the colors we can do this teal line. Would you like some butter pats with teal on it um, in this circle uh, for your restaurant? And so that's a piece I got um, that I, I got on eBay. Don't, I know I didn't go to a store and find it, but I found it on eBay. Um, but that's a one I really found interesting because it talks kind of about behind the manufacturing of it a little bit more and the selling of it, which I thought was fun. That's a great example. So one example I had was um, a Pez MP3 player. Um, what I think is really interesting about this is that, you know, MP3 players were something that became really popular, but now it's not really something that I think people would have anymore now that you have all your music on your phone or whatnot, that this is really an example of something that is really specific to like a very narrow time period that when this was manufactured in 2005, um, you know, it, it really is, in, is of that exact time period. And we, we thought about at the time we were like, oh, should we open it? Because we thought MP3 players would be cool and useful to have because it's better than the CD player. But, you know, I'm glad we, we didn't end up opening it because it became obsolete so quickly um, with, with new phones. I, I really wow. like hearing that, um, Brian. And also, I should mm -hmm. add that you are an archaeologist. Am I right? Sure. And so that's um, that's an example of something we really love as an archaeologist is if you have an artifact that only appears at a certain period of time, that that, that can really help you understand what those people were doing um, at that time period. So Pez would be a fantastic archaeological um, collection of artifacts to find because they are very uh, time sensitive. So things like a, a particular movie comes out and they make those Pez for that movie. You know, you can really get a good date on when, when, uh, when they were being manufactured. Mm. It, is that, it reminds me a little bit of your, uh, some of them are series like the uh, presidential series. That was a particular time, um, I guess, recorded about presidents up to Barack Obama, I believe. Uh, what do you think might be the future of, of, of other things like that? Sure. Um, so there, there is, you know, like uh, uh, Pez really comes out with these collections and sometimes they, they keep coming out with new collections. That, like, for, for example, Disney is something that they, they always try and come out with a new Disney. And in the 90s, if you kind of remember, they, they had the kind of, they tried to make Disney characters kind of hip and cool. And so they would wear like sunglasses and stuff like that. And so you can get a sense of how those sort of, um, characters change through time and so whether they'll continue to add to the presidential collection I don't know um, they, they came out in sets of five so uh, you know we would need to get three more presidents before they'd have another set ready so um, Pez isn't always the best to sort of stick into um, their plans there was a Pez Earth was the first planet series that they did but then they and even on the box, it said the first part of the planet series, but then they never actually came out with any mm -hmm. other planets. <laughs> so it does kind of depend on how well they sell. Hmm. Thanks for sharing that. Oh. We've got a couple questions for Laura and Elliot. How many different kinds of geodes are there and how are they formed? And along those lines, um, how do the geode hunters know if a rock is a geode and not just a rock? <laughs> Those are really good questions. Um, so, uh, you know, the primary, the, the first part is being in the right place, right? So these are all found within 40 miles of Keokuk, Iowa. Um, and there's a specific type of geode called a Keokuk geode. Um, there are different kinds of geodes all, all over the world, but this kind is specific to our region. And of course, it's the state rock of Iowa. Um, they are always round or roundish. Um, sometimes they have been, um, uh, cracked and then they'll come back together so they'll be kind of squat and round um, but they stand out as being sort of um, little orbs um, they are they're kind of a mystery um, in some ways they but the the general philosophy of how they formed or the general idea of how they formed is that there were um, nodules or concretions in the bottom of the ocean floor so we're talking about the Mississippian era while well, this area was all ocean 
Um, and then the, the water um, around these concretions um, basically carved out a cave, right? Dissolved the inside of these sedimentary rocks. And then this mineral laden water, this mineral heavy water um, was in the vicinity and eventually uh, grew crystals, the crystalline structures on the inside of the geodes. Um, almost all Keokuk geodes are filled with quartz, um, but there are 17 identified minerals that can be found in them, um, and it's always exciting to find a secondary mineral. We find a lot with agate. Um, on the slideshow, there was some with the sort of grayish um, white color. Those are agates. Um, uh, chalcony, uh, calcite. Calcite is probably the most common, so that's like a, a white um, powderish substance. Um, you can actually make fine china out of tie-in to Elizabeth, um, and um, rust, a lot of rust and iron deposits, pyrite, things like that um, are inside of these. So you never know kind of what you're going to get. But the most um, important part to really finding them is being in the right area. And a lot of times you find like one or two in an area, and then you follow the creek up to wherever they're starting. So you just follow up the creek, and eventually you'll find where they are so, so uh, abundant that you just you're choosing geos more than hunting them. So <laughs> the closer you get to where they're from, the more you're sort of picking um, the geos that you want to take home, which is actually what we've been doing lately since we have so many now. Um, Elliot and his brother Grant um, measure and weigh the geos before we take them in, because the less they weigh, the prettier they generally are inside um, because they're hollow. So the some of them are some of them are solid quartz and those aren't so pretty. But um, we make measurements and we have a little fish scale and we see how big they are and the um, uh, they uh, yeah get to figure out which ones are going to be pretty before we even crack them. That's great. Um, so I feel this is going very naturally into allowing the audience to ask any other questions. We do have quite a few questions coming in um, and I welcome people to um, try to put the questions in the Q&A if you don't mind, because it will be easier to sort of um, look for uh, certain questions. We got an interesting question in terms of um, what is the difference between a collection and somebody that might be hoarding? Um, uh, from my research, I've just seen that uh, collectors will um, will order and display their collections in a very specific way. Uh, somebody that might be um, uh, exhibiting signs of hoarding uh, may not have that, uh, may, may be having a more of a disarray of their objects. Uh, t it's t overtaking spaces in the home that uh, normally wouldn't be taking up spaces. So there's some, there's some things there. Um, that, is, that I would recommend if you want to learn more about. Um, there's an experimental scientist named um, Dave, excuse me, let me get the right name here. Um, Dave uh, Karchik, excuse me, and he has a really good tech talk TED talk that talks about um, a little bit on the differences and the brain science behind collecting and what parts of the brain um, are sort of being used more heavily than others when it comes to collecting versus hoarding. So I'm going to put that in the chat for people that are interested in that. Thank you, you for know, that question. I also, I binge watched hoarders actually like last month because it came on Hulu or ah, something. And I, yeah. as I was watching it, I was like, I am I a hoarder because like there was a lot of things that these people were saying that I was like I understand where they're coming from yes you get emotional attachment and my I would say like one of the reasons the difference is maybe curation like yes for yes. instance there was a woman on there that had teddy bears but she wasn't really curating anytime she saw a teddy bear she was grabbing it yeah. and and putting it into the collection and like I see a lot of butter pats in antique stores and I don't get them because I'm like, well, this one doesn't quite fit. Like, and I don't know if that is enough to signify a difference, but that's, that's one difference I think that there is, is like, I can let a butter pat go and not, and not feel right. the need to have it. Right. So you would say that maybe it's more of it like the collectors, um, like the, the collectors here and, and other collectors that we know, it's more of a side or an addition to other other things that they're doing in their lives versus something that's completely taking over someone's life. Possibly. Yeah, but I would definitely watch those videos that you mentioned because this is this is just my own observations. <laughs> right. I also too. binge watched hoarders and was like, yeah. hmm, what is the difference? Because I'm not <laughs> quite sure, you know. Um, we also have a question for Brian. Where are Pez dispensers made and what's the history of them? If you can give us a quick recap. Sure. Uh, so they were actually invented in Austria in uh, 1927 as, um, as mint dispensers. 
so one of the older ones I have here, um, this one's probably from the 40s. Uh, it, it doesn't have the, the head and it just dispenses individual mints and it was kind of marketed as a as an alternative to smoking. Um, but Pez, as we sort of know them today, um, really uh, took off in the 1950s when they started bringing them over to America. And that's when they started putting on Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, um, and putting more famous heads on it. And that's when, you know, the popularity of collecting them uh, really exploded. Um, so today they're still, they're, they're manufactured now mostly in Connecticut for the American ones. Uh, so you can go and tour the, the, the Pez factory and they finally have an actual museum there. So we're hoping to get out there and, and check that out uh, for ourselves. Uh, that sounds great. Right. Uh, thank you, Brian, for that. Um, so another question, uh, Denny Lynch is asking, what is the status of state funding of collections, their care and sufficient space for growth? Um, so as Carolina and I both know, when you work in a place that collects collections, <laughs> basically, um, space is always your biggest problem. Funding I can't really speak to funding um, because I'm not in charge of that here in my department, but you know, it depends on where the state is at um, as a whole. And, but space, that's always, that's always an issue. Um, and it does feel like Tetris a lot of the times, but um, when we're taking in collections, we always, the top thing is research value. We just wanna make sure that whatever we take in, um, we know that users are gonna use uh, for, for a plethora of reasons, whether, whether it's creative use for our playwrights here on campus or our artists, or whether it's for research uh, use for papers or, or books or, or things like that as well, or documentaries. So we'll find the space if we feel like there's enough research value into it. Uh, as an archeologist, I can kind of speak to that too, where our, the state archeologist has um, a big repository of um, archeological collections. And we've kind of maxed out our building for um, eight places that we can kind of convert to storage. And so we've had to tell our archeologists, you know, like you gotta be more selective with what you send to us to curate that you really need to make sure it does have that research value. So if it's just a, a farmstead from the early 20th century, well, there's there's an awful lot of them. And so that's kind of redundant material is, is what we kind of call sites like that. And so we say, okay, just take pictures and document the stuff good, but maybe we don't need to hold that onto that, that sort of thing forever. Exactly, and sometimes it's like, yeah, another repository is a better place for a collection yeah. and we have to say goodbye and be like, uh, ISU collects more fabric than we do, so we suggest you go because they have a textile conservation area, right? And that it might really hurt to say that, but like, you know, we'll know they're taken care of over there too. So we have time for a few more questions. I did want to, the one uh, Angela asked, how do you keep track of your collections? Uh, who would like to share? I'm horrible at keeping track of my collections. I'm going to be very honest. I've got some displayed. I've got some in a cabinet. I've got some in a closet. I've got more butter pads than I have room for at this point. Um, I just need to get more retired old men to make me shelves as well. <laughs> I, need, I need my grandpa back. Um, but, you know, I think uh, I, I do have to wash them. This is actually a question I asked all the all the uh, collectors the other day. I was like, how do you clean your collection? Um, and so when I you know, I, I wash them twice a year. And so when I do that, that's kind of my inventory to kind of like look and, and make sure I'm keeping track of everything that I have. <laughs> well, I think the best thing about our collection is that we barely keep track of it. <laughs> um, and that it's made for sharing. So it's our favorite thing to give them, um, give geodes away to take other kids, you know, now that we're starting to get uh, back open, we take other kids geode hunting with us, find their own treasures. But mine's always been about integrating it into learning and a passion for science in general. Um, I think back in your original slides, the very beginning of this, um, you mentioned the internet as a source. And I think, you know, of course, with something more concrete like the other two questions, you can go and look for those things. But one of the biggest things that we do on the internet is compare geodes and fossils with other hunters um, and decide what's worth keeping and what's not. 
Um, there are terrific forums on Facebook and um, Reddit, different places that can help you identify the weird things that you find and um, help you decide what to keep. So um, our collection is primarily in giant laundry baskets on my porch. I probably need a better system. Um, and uh, the guy who built the shelf uh, is actually on the webinar, so hi to Ryan. So the shelf that we have is the closest we've ever come to keeping any kind of track of our rock, I think. <laughs> Uh, so our, our collection is is uh, documented in my wife's brain uh, is uh, luckily she she keeps pretty good track of uh, what we do have and don't have um, but as our collection has expanded it's become much more difficult for me to give her a Pez as a present because I it's hard for me to know whether we have them or not and so I, I have to kind of go and pick really rare ones to give her now. Um, so maybe that's her excuse to trick me into um, buying really rare ones for her is she's, uh, is those are the only ones I know that she doesn't have. Um, so she can get me to buy her some uh, more expensive, hard to get ones. Brian, where was the museum again? Someone asked that in the chat. They missed it when you said it before. It's, it's in Connecticut. Uh, I'd have to look up what the town is. We can always put it in the chat once sure. you find out. Yeah. Uh, and no worries to that. Um, I'm going to uh, jump back over to Laura. We have a few questions for you, Laura. Um, two. One, how does the geode get it's color the color blue uh where does that come from and then um and laura answered those in the chat to oh did she did too. thank yep. thank you for answering okay so um are there any other questions that we want to highlight i actually had a question for our two collector well they don't need to hear from me but like what reactions do you get to your collection so laura you were saying you you give a lot of them away brian you have so many when people come to your house and see this wall of pez like what reactions from others do you get for your collection uh people love the idea that it's a treasure hunt in our case right like you're literally going out and finding these little rocks and there's treasures inside i mean it may not be a like a valuable thing but it's it's so much fun and kids and adults alike love this like grown up Easter egg hunt. Um, and we, you know, like I said, we really tie it back to education and um, how to, how to um, be observing our world. Um, you know, Brian's a, an archeologist. We find um, things like arrowheads and things out. Um, in fact, we found a stone ax out on one of our uh, geo collection, collecting expeditions. So it always intersects with other things. And I think that's been the best part of it for us. Hmm. Uh, you too, yeah, Elliot. <laughs> well, I think I think it's sort of best uh, said in, in an old Seinfeld episode that you can't you can't look at a Pez and not smile. Um, so we've uh, just had moved to a new house, and so we've had a couple of the kids from the neighborhood um, when we're introducing ourselves to them say, "Hey, come take a look in this room over here. I have something I think you'll you'll think is pretty cool." Um, so it's always brings a smile to people's face. And um, the great thing about Pez is um, it's uh, kind of a collection where there's always something for someone. There's always something that, um, there's some Pez that everyone's gonna be able to kind of connect with. Uh, a guy I work with is really excited when I showed him some Star Trek Pez that he thought were really cool. Uh, and there's, we have Elvis Pez and things like that. So really for every everyone there is there is some some kind of pez that, that they're going to have a connection with thank you um i'm oh go ahead elizabeth <laughs> i'm trying to um does anyone else have i mean i've got a few more questions but does anyone else in the audience we've got time for like one more question for everybody and then we're gonna yeah. kind of tell you how you can get involved in my collections Yes, I think I got my audio back. Sorry about that. Um, at, if you're yeah, writing in the chat, go ahead and add. Oh, go ahead. What was that, Laura? I said Elliot wants to volunteer and answer to a question that wasn't asked. But, oh, uh, go can ahead. You them, could, we, could you tell them how we crack them? So if we get one like this, how, how, what are the steps to crack one? First, we get safety goggles so none of the sharp parts go in your eye if there is any. And second, 
can get a hammer. So that's some way and then we do what? We hammer it light first if it could be like um just not so uh strong and then we just hit it harder and harder until it cracks. <laughs> but if it's like really big then the, you can order a geode cracker. So you wrap a chain around the geode and then you push these two ones down. It's good to put your foot on it and then push it down with your hand and it can snap okay. it right in half. So any of them that are snapped really well in half, that's a soil pipe cutter. And uh, that is how, if you see the museum, any of them that look like they're very nicely cracked, that probably wasn't a hammer. That was the soil pipe cutter. So I um, thought uh, maybe that would be interesting. But safety goggles, very important. So if you get one of ours from the museum, safety goggles. Thank oh, you, Laura. Going. I love, I love that. Thank you, Elliot, for providing those really great instructions. Um, I'm going to ask one more question, then we're going to have to wrap up our session. But if there are, if there, if it's okay with our collectors, if there are few people after the session that have further questions, they really, really want to get answered. Um, our collectors could be on for a few minutes if they are able. Um, I think I want to ask my last question would be is if if someone is just starting to learn, you know, interested in collecting, but they don't know really where to begin or um, how would you advise somebody who might want to get started collecting in uh, in butter pat dishes or, or pez or, or geodes or collecting in general? Find something you love. If you're going to collect it, I mean, none of mine are worth money or anything like that. Um, but that's okay. I. I started collecting these because it was something to do with my mom that I really loved and I enjoyed our time together doing this, um, which is why I love seeing Laura and Elliot's story because it reminds me of how I started. And I think that's the most important thing. You've got to find something that captivates your interests long enough for you to keep collecting. Because um, what's the point of a collection if you don't take any joy from it? Yeah, I, you I, know, I agree with that uh, too, that we, you know, we've, kind of made an effort to not really uh, collect the particularly expensive um, Pez that, um, and that kind of helped us as we were collecting Pez when we were just graduating college and didn't have a lot of money. Well, you know, it's two or three bucks um, for, a, for a current Pez. So you could kind of continue the collection um, uh, even, you know, uh, and it wouldn't put an undue financial burden on you. Um, and things like that. So maybe putting some kind of limitations on what you're collecting um, will help you um, keep keep you sane too. It'll help you so that you don't feel like you got to have everything if you kind of try and um, focus on something sort of realistic. You don't have to have every single different type of thing, but maybe uh, things that are you're able to get at that time and you have the space for and you can look at enough to appreciate that you're not and I <laughs> shoving I it in a box echo, and hiding it away. I'd echo that. My biggest advice would be to edit. We do a thing called tossing them back. <laughs> if we find one that we can't crack, if it's kind of just blah, if we're not really into it, we toss them back out into the creek. They'll be fine. Um, so editing is really important or else you have 400 pounds of geodes on your porch. Oh, wait, I still have that. But... <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. That's a really, really great advice. Um, we've put into the chat, by the way, um, the My Collections website, which actually features our collectors. So um, I understand that maybe a few of you um, may have not seen uh, the images that we have, um, but we do have more images of each of our collectors. And uh, one collector that isn't here, uh, unfortunately, couldn't make it, Colton Neely, who features his music collection, over 20,000 pieces of music, including a recording of him playing a ragtime piece that he owns. Um, so I recommend that you go to the Pentecrest Museums.uiowa.edu My Collections 
And we're also going to provide um, for those interested other, um, if you could go back one more slide, sorry. Elizabeth, sorry, other program opportunities that we're going to have in the future from the libraries and from the museums, um, like our CARES um, Co Connected for Life program and uh, other opportunities that you can engage with the museums. Our collectors have been incredibly kind to offer their information as well. So if you have a specific question or you want to follow up, they would love to hear from you. <laughs> yeah, I know we didn't get to all questions, so please yeah. feel free to reach out. Yes, yes. Um, again, we're so happy you could join us. Um, if uh, we could virtually um, just say thank you to the to the collectors that were able to come to us today, and we're so honored to have them. We're so proud of the fact that um, our museums can share in these perspectives and new narratives that um, uh, that create a more participatory, participatory and community-based engagement at the museums. So um, thank you all. Uh, this will be recorded and sent out and shared. And we look forward to seeing you the next time. You can also apply for the My Collection starting in August. So look out, the website has all the information and an FAQ for those interested in showcasing their collections here at the Pentecost Museums. Thanks everyone, and it is one o'clock. We are wrapping up, and Elizabeth, we're so glad that you could help host this session with me. It's been a great pleasure. It's been so much fun. I, I love talking and hearing about everyone's collections, and also from our viewers, um, everyone's wide array of things that they collect is also just a lot of fun to read, so uh, we'll have to do this again for sure. Definitely.